James is saying, let's wait, and everyone else is not even voting. Red spotted newt. In the baby stage. Quinn, can you go out that way? That's not terrible. Yeah, this is a vernal pool. The leaf litter is dark, right? Yep. That's a pretty deep one, too. If you think about it. Yeah, this is the main part. This is the whole thing. water. Nice one, nice little guy. Cool. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. And he hopped away. Get him. He's right there. He's right there. You flipped him. Here we go. Cool. Little spring oh, yeah. peeper. You can definitely see the last one. So, what is the characteristic <laughs> we're using for identification with this little guy? The X on the back. Yeah, you're looking at the X on the back and what else? His toe pads. His toe pads. Yeah. Remember? That's why he's able to climb like that because he's not a true tree frog. But he does have characteristics of the tree frogs. This is a cute little one. So we'll put him back up here. That's our spring peeper. Red spotted meat. And what is the stage of this one? The what? Stage. F stage. So the terrestrial F stage. He's so tiny. And then a nice marble. So the red one is terrestrial F. That's the terrestrial F stage of the Eastern New. Is that male? No. This looks like a male, yep. Yep, definitely a male. You can tell by the color on the marbled salamanders. You remember this sexually dimorphic characteristic we look for? What is it? The color of the padding. The, the color of the marbling. So on the males, it tends to be what color? White. More like white. Right, white, right. And then on the females, it's more Blue, of a grayish blue, color. Right. right. That's cool. Beautiful little marble. Okay. Where's our little newt? We ready to put him back? <laughs> He's cute. Under trash. <laughs> That's great. And it's sad. Very angry. Yeah, they're angry. But if we look, this is the critical thing here. The critical part is all of this. What are we looking at here? Fertilized soil. Well, worm droppings. Worm castings, yeah, right. So that's worm droppings, basically. And if you look here, you dig down, I mean, just the layers upon layers of worm casting before you get to soils that are not influenced by the behavior and activity of the worm itself. So what we're seeing here, these are all freshly fallen leaves. So this is all the leaf matter. This is what the worms are feeding on. Yeah. Isn't that a good oh, thing? Oh, that's a pretty one. Decomposing stuff? It's a good thing, but not in a natural forested ecosystem because it increases the rate of decomp decomposition 
and it redistributes the nutrients within the soil profile differently than what a forest cool. can healthily uptake. So what, that allows extra fuel and fertilizer it, for invasives to use? Well, it takes away from the native species, it takes away the nutrients they need to survive, but also if you look at this soil here, it's very dry. Yeah, yeah it is. That's because there was no leaf litter here until recently when these fresh leaves fell. Yeah. There should be a coating of leaves on the forest floor at all times as they slowly decompose. But that's not what's happening with the introduction of non-native earthworms. And we'll talk more about that. I have a whole lecture on that, so I don't want to get into it too much now. This is a beautiful F. That's the, the typical color that you would expect to see. That bright orange. And why are they orange? And this one, remember, was just active walking around just now. Why is it able to do that? Yes, it's poisonous, right? So this actually is a toxic species. There are poisons in this, which protects it from various predators that would otherwise eat it. But they know because of its brightly colored orange coloration that they can't eat it. It's a very pretty one. This would be last year's baby. All right. Put this back down. He was right over there. Let's not step on him. A lot of newts here. I think we can safely just put this back down because it's not flush to the ground. Tall like trees. It's a remnant from that era. What's it called? Forest tree. There's more oh. over here. Oh. Yeah, most of these are sedated. They didn't pass. Okay. So, some sort of a predator got to them before they fully matured, and the predator will dig them up and feed on them. That's so depressing. Well, it's a part of the life cycle. Yeah. yeah. Most turtle eggs don't make it. And even the ones that do, then they still have a long struggle to go through before they become adults. Under every log. If you roll over that one too. So why is this an issue? We'll talk about it. Not, not right today. You think a, you, do you think a snake would be under the same log as all those worms? Yeah, yeah, that's a possibility, but I mean, just it's crazy. So many. Yeah. We should collect some and throw them to the trout. Does anyone have something to put them in? A container? No. Nope. Those worms. Could we potentially vote on taking one of our classes at night to find some nocturnal stuff? That would be pretty awesome. Yeah, I think it'd be a lot of fun. I'd, I'd be down. What do you think of that?
need some almonds. What's up? Let me open some almonds. Yeah. lays its eggs under a log or in a moist environment, stays with the eggs and the eggs develop and then they hatch out to little mini guys like this. This is actually this year's baby. So in an area like we were just in with a bunch of invasive earthworms which change the forest floor composition and the macroinvertebrate ver composition, these guys drop off really quick. This is a <laughs> just jumped out of my head. Um, he, they're supposed to be the most common vertebrate species that you would find in an impact forested landscape in Connecticut. And when you're not finding those under logs that you're flipping, you know that there's some serious things happening to your forest that are causing it to degrade. And that will happen over a short and long period of time, depending on how many invasive species move in. But this is a great sign that this is a healthy... <laughs> He's a jumper! I never had one jump so much, it's so funny. All right. What was that? Usually for that to happen, you would need it to be a little bit less in the ground like that, but you can get nice salamanders on one, one that's burrowed in that deep. But as far as snakes go, it's not that common to get them under stuff that's really stuck into the ground. Yes, sir. What do you love about field bio? Oh, I love uh, being able to see the organisms that live around us, especially things that you wouldn't see unless you were looking for them. You know, lots of salamanders, snakes. You learn a lot about the environment that we live in and uh, a lot more about our state, too. And there's probably a good sense of pride in that, isn't there? I think so. Knowing a thing or two about where you come from. Yeah. What do you like about field biology? I like finding geological features. <laughs> Are you a leaf eater? I don't really know do we have any leaf eaters here? Uh, like you eat leaves? Just. Well, <laughs> you eat anything. No, you like. Found it, yes, you find it on the tops of mountains in very hot, dry areas in Connecticut. So you notice as we came up, we started to see this, and we're seeing a lot more of it now that we're in the hottest and driest area. Pitch pine. Pitch pine. Right. Yep, so that's pitch pine. What's unique about pitch pine as far as its life cycle goes? Does it produce pine, pine cones at an early age? It does use pine cones, so the pine cones would be the reproducing structure. And what would it take for the seeds within that pine cone to germinate? Fire. 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 Right. So that's one of the species that requires fire for seed to germinate fire breaks down the outer seed coat. Pretty neat, huh? You don't want to grab a pine cone in one of those pitch pines? He walked off from it that way. <laughs> He's not important yet. All right, you see the difference in these pine cones? Yes. What do you think the difference is in these pine cones? The visible difference that you're seeing. And I'm not really lying that much. One's open, one's not. What else is the big difference between these? The way the In general, the size, right? Yeah. They're smaller. Right. So when we think about a flower, we have what? For as far as reproduction goes. Think about people. As far as reproduction goes, we have males and we have females. females. There's male and female pine cones. This is a male pine cone. This is a female pine cone. So the pollen comes out of this pine cone is dispersed through the air to this pine cone. And if you look at big pine trees, and you can kind of see it on those white pines way, 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 way far out in the distance, all of the male pine cones, so the boys, are chilling at the top of the tree. All the females are below, on the bottom of the tree. And the reason why is all the male pine cones release their pollen, and it gets blown down by the air to the females. And that's what is actually 
fertilizing the seeds inside of this pine cone. Now, we talk about pine cones and we say that they're conifers, right? Um, what is one of the big differences between a conifer and something that is, um, what, what's the other term that we use to describe plants? Deciduous. Deciduous, Deciduous plants. So say for example, like a maple tree or an apple tree, what's the big difference? Well, they both have leaves, but one has leaves Let, versus needles. Let's, they both have leaves. So the pine needles that you're seeing are leaves. Those are modified leaves. Mm -hmm. Leaves drop or no, stay let's think about, think about reproduction. This is a reproduction lesson. What's the difference between like a pitch pine, a white pine, and an oak or an apple tree? The seeds are contained inside. That's part of it. We're gonna get to that. But prior to that containment. Flowers are different. Flowers. That's the difference. So oak trees, birch trees, apple trees, all of those are flowering plants. The pine trees don't get any flowers. They just produce pollen. Now when we get to the actual fruit, this is the fruit of a pine tree. It's not technically called a fruit because there is no fleshy material. So if you take, talk about an apple, an apple is basically a bunch of fruit that is there to protect the seed, but not really protect the seed. What's the purpose of the fleshy stuff surrounding the seeds of an apple? So that something can eat it. That's so something is coaxed into eating it. So it, the tree is giving this the species that is distributing the seeds a reason to distribute those seeds by giving it a little bit of nourishment in the process. This does not have any of that. So because it doesn't have any of that, what would be one of the primary methods of dispersal for this seed? Rolling. Wind, typically. Rolling. Wind. Animals definitely eat them, but wind would be a good way for this to be dispersed. And that's one of the ways that they are dispersed. So if we look at an individual thing here, these are a bit sharp. It's hard to see in this one. If we get to a white pine cone, I'll show you again. But there's two little dark circles in each one of these little segments of the pine cone itself. And that's what holds the seeds. That's where the seeds are. This is actually a female pine cone that's not opened up. But a male would look basically identical to this. It's just not. It's just a female that's not opened up. That's where I lie. Sorry. Fire that would not have the ability to terminate. You can see there's another one right there. And you can see right behind us. So how long Small will the seeds baby last pitch ungerminated? Oh, long, long time. So you'll just, years. they'll be there until there happens to be. Very, very cool. Beautiful red eyes. So, Check ID. We got the background coloration is on this one, almost like a reddish color, but it could be brighter than this, not by much. And then darker brown. You always have these light bands cream colored bands going across the back. And if you look closely, each one of those bands is outlined by one row of black scales. See that pattern that's outlined there? Mm -hmm. And then when you flip them over, that Check checkerboard it. pattern underneath. Absolutely gorgeous snake. Now, another ID or identifying characteristic is the pattern on the top of the milk snake's head. You see on this little guy right here, how it's like shaped like a Y yeah. or a V? There's always a distinctive Y or V-shaped pattern on the top of the milk snake's head. Very easy to distinguish from copperheads, which it's often confused for. Another species that's commonly confused for, believe it or not, is a rattlesnake. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you why. Actually, just move your foot for one second so everyone can see. I'll come up here and see if we can anger him enough to do it. He might not do it. <laughs> I don't want to get him too upset. But what they'll do is, there you go, oh. see him? Oh, yeah. him vibrating his tail? Yeah, it did. So it's people cool. see that, and then they think that it's a rattlesnake. See how he's doing yeah. that? Yeah. And if you look at the tail with those bands, it almost looks like buttons of a rattle. Yeah. So that's why people often confuse this for rattlesnakes. They don't get big though, right? These will get around three feet. Oh. This oh, is geez. a baby. This is a two-year-old. This is an absolutely gorgeous, I, I gorgeous specimen. That. Uh, you just missed two black racers. Oh my god. <laughs> 20 feet away. Plenty of time to plan. <laughs> what a beauty, though. 
So what is unique about this species in the sense of how does it capture its prey and what sort of prey does this species eat? Insects. Potentially could eat insects. This wasn't the constrictor one, was This it? is the constrictor. Yep, so this is one of Connecticut's true constrictors. This will eat typically mammals. Really? And it will also eat other snakes. No what? Yep, so the ringnecks, racers, can eat a snake basically the same size as itself. I once came across one that had about two inches of a snake's tail hanging out of its mouth and the rest of the snake was in the milk snake. He was just digesting it and then... Good find, Mason. Thanks, Quinn. That's a pretty one. It's a very pretty one. This is a very, very pretty one. Are you getting a picture or you want me to? I'll get a picture. I'll post it, don't worry. <laughs> So this is good stuff like that. Nice to see a milk snake. So they're constrictor and they eat snakes? They can eat snakes and small mammals. How would they get? They'd constrict another snake, they'd get yep. around it and actually wrap around it and suffocate it. Are rat snakes considered they're considered two constrictors too, right? Or no? Um, rat snakes are constrictors too. Look at the two W's on it. And then a W. That's cool. Will they eat skinks? That's a pretty, pretty milk snake. We got lucky with this one. Wish I had my good camera with me. I would have put this one in the book. Very pretty one. Oh, a whole bunch of them. Mm -hmm. Decent size. Just some red backs. This in it isn't really important. I figured this was going to happen, and it did happen. Oh my god. Why'd you want to find two? Uh, because we have. Digger's always better. We have a very interesting ringneck snake that we actually don't know that much about. This, the ringneck snake in Connecticut, falls between the grade between the southern and the northern ringneck. The southern ringneck is slightly different in color, a little more orange underneath, um, and it has spots that run down the venter. So if you look at this one, it has spotting that runs down the belly scales. That's very, very unusual for a ringneck snake to have in Connecticut. Usually the belly is solid yellow in color. So this could potentially be a, hybrid. a hybridized... A on you. All right, get it. A hybridized individual between the southern yeah, and the northern, yeah. but we would have to do, obviously, yeah. some serious yeah. genetic studies to figure some of that stuff out. Michael, would that be it? It would be northern because it had no yellow. See the difference? Yeah. See the spotting on the belly? Mm -hmm. The spotting is a characteristic of the southern ring neck. And you get it in a few of the northerns. That's a good one. You can see the head in there. That's a good one. Good find, though. Uh, this one's, as far as ring necks go, pretty light in color. Um, they can be a dark black slate gray all the way down to this lighter gray. And you notice the characteristic ring behind the head right around the neck. Does anyone, um, has, well, the reason the belly is colorful is that they actually use that as a warning in case something wants to try to get them. Mm. And they, he won't do it for us, but they'll curl their tails up and expose that yellow underbelly. And believe it or not, these guys are not a traditional venomous species, but the saliva in this is actually pretty toxic and has been to a certain degree um, correlated with some of the, having, sharing some of the same um, characteristics as those of the elapid snakes, which are Mamas. your crates, cobras, coral snakes, things like that. So some of the really 
toxic, toxic. Like the rattlers had the ridged ones. So they oh, like this is this would be smooth. smooth. Both the species that we got are smooth. You're talking about the the keels yeah, on yeah, the scale. Keels. This is a keel. I believe keels. This shouldn't have any keels. It feels so smooth. Yeah. Is there any? Can they get fungal? They can get fungal too, right? Yeah, you actually have fungal. That's what I mean. Do you want to? No, no, there's not enough to kill it. He has some. Yeah, because I, I saw the little black. Yeah, he's got a little bit of it. What, what is it? Uh, fungal is like a lesion that's happening on these snakes. And it's actually uh, spreading pretty rapidly through snakes of North America. So we're investigating. Yeah, see that little like, like darker area there? Yeah. And this is a very mild infection. But some of the um, snakes that have really severe infections, they'll cause deep ne necrotic lesions, even into bone tissue, and eventually cause death to the snake. A lot of them, especially the pit vipers, will get all sorts of um, lesions in their pits and um, in their nostrils, and it causes this, this um, disfiguring of the, of the face to the extent that it's so bad they can't even feed. This one's terrible. not disfigured, is it? No, that one's not disfigured at all. Is that it's common in Connecticut for some, the uh, we've had no? We've had um, disfigure, disfigured timbers in Connecticut. If you actually, if you go onto my website here, hold on so I can get a picture of this. Um, there's a picture of one that we treated. 